what if I say to you that the word play and the word theater are completely different things? And today we are going to get introduced to a certain kind of drama and a certain kind of dramatist who first established the relevance of this difference. The difference between play and theatre, the difference between text and performance. So stay with me till the end of this video because we are going to look at not just the biography of the playwright but also the context, the conditions and finally the entire summary of the wonderful play. So first things first, let me take you to the year 1848 and let me take you to Europe. You already must have had some idea about the French Revolution which took place some time back in 1789 and now I'm taking you to 1848 when a series of revolutions across different European nations destabilized the entire idea of monarchy. These revolutions were mostly driven by ideas of democracy, liberalism and most importantly nationalism. Europe had already seen the height of romanticism and we have also had a glimpse of what that looks like through the British romantics like Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, Keats, Byron. Now, as a natural flow of civilization, after every high tide comes a low tide. And romanticism as a movement started to lose its grip. And to fill that vacuum, what emerged in European consciousness is realism. Two important things were happening in Europe at the time. One, the rapid industrialization and creation of these urban centers, rise of the middle class. And on the other hand, there was Charles Darwin who brings out this origin of species. And he clearly states that whatever is written in the Bible about man's genesis, about man's origin, is not at all true. A vacuum thus created in faith is replaced by science. At the same time, there was Auguste Comte, who was bringing out this idea of positivism, which essentially talks about close observation and the study of cause and effect in nature. Drama is such a genre which is most affected by society. Uh, that is primarily because drama for its sustenance has to depend on the people who go and watch the plays. And therefore, through the evolution of drama, we can understand how society was evolving. Earlier, drama used to present these larger-than-life characters, these tragic heroes, uh, or sometimes these uh, drawing rooms of high society people, upper-class elite society, which we uh, see in case of sentimental dramas, the well-made plays. But... With the changes in society, drama started to focus on the real-life struggles of real human beings, even the working classes. So what is realism? Realism is its not just a movement in drama. Uh, it's generally seen that every movement first comes in the genre of painting and art. It is perhaps because painters are usually uh, more open to experimentation, they are more imaginative and they are always uh, willing to do something new. And during the mid-1800s, we see emergence of a painting style which started to depict real life and its details as if that is really worth presenting. It was also a time when photography was uh, coming up. All right. So everything happened in that milieu and that led to a preference for presentation of reality. Now, how do you present reality on stage? When you go and watch a drama, you already know that you are watching a drama. Coleridge, he had said that when we go and see anything um, acted upon stage, we 
suspend our sense of disbelief. So it's like we do not remember that we are watching something imaginary. And that makes us feel like we are seeing a real thing. But here I'm talking about presenting reality itself on stage so that that suspension of disbelief is no longer required. How is that accomplished? Or how did the playwrights back then accomplish that? The first thing that they worked on was setting up the stage. The stage looked like the ordinary spaces that a common man inhabits. A common man's living room, uh, maybe uh, an office chamber which they can identify with, uh, a factory set up, a random street which is very ordinary. So the setting is shifted from artificial ones to real ones. So you can see how when an audience was looking at the stage, the audience was immediately connecting his own experience with the one going on on the stage. The second important aspect is dialogue. Use of natural everyday conversation. That was a very important element that the practitioners of realism introduced. And that means they did away with those long soliloquies and monologues and unrealistic sides where you know, you are speaking on stage, other characters are present, but you are pretending as if they cannot hear you. That is so unrealistic and nothing unrealistic uh, was shown on stage which was not probable or possible under real circumstances. Characters were not black and white anymore, uh, shades were coming up and the fine line between tragedy and comedy was getting blurred. Earlier, there were plays which were tragic-comic, uh, but this was not exactly a tragic-comic scenario. It was realism in a sense that, in reality, life is neither tragic nor comic. It is not entirely doomed, nor is it entirely cheerful and happy. There is no uh, question of a happy ending or a sad ending, because there is no ending. There is kind of a flow. And drama captures just a chunk of that slowing thing called life. And when you do away with tragedy or comedy, then what happens? You also do away with the idea of tragic hero, with that larger-than-life persona, with that seriousness with which uh, you look at the crimes committed or the inspiring elements that you get from those uh, moments. What is it replaced with? It is replaced with identification. You identify immediately with the situation on stage. You immediately identify with the characters on stage because those characters are the grey characters, the shades which you actually see around you. And why just around you is the character you see as your reflection in the mirror every day. Another important change that was brought in was, of course, in the way these characters dressed, uh, the costumes, the props, everything was mundane, ordinary, common and natural. I am using the word natural, although there is a, a, an altogether different genre called naturalistic play, which is, uh, if not entirely different from realism, but is like an extension of it. That we can speak about later. In a way, we can say the characters, the set, the costume, the dialogue, the characterization, everything is built on the idea of reality being represented on stage. Because if you look at the dominant school of philosophy during the period that I'm talking about, it was a period when empiricism flourished. Empiricism, in a sense, you get to know about the world through your five senses. And that is also because this was a time that coincided with the development of science. Does that mean imagination takes a back seat? Not altogether. Because we also see a lot of symbolism in these plays, which is kind of telling you that real life, when it is observed closely and when it is thought about closely, it also has very strong symbolic elements in it. 
at the forefront of this movement in drama was Henrik Ibsen. He kind of revolutionized the theater through introducing what we were now calling realism. But did he do that just with a bang, just in the very beginning of his career? No. Author's biography usually scares students away, doesn't it? But I will kind of pick up things which I think you will find very interesting and that's going to help you understand the way his mind was actually changing. Ibsen was born in a remote town in Norway and he was actually born into a very wealthy family. But he was around six or seven when his father went bankrupt and the entire household kind of changed. They could survive. It's not like they were totally impoverished, but that old wealth was gone and he grew up and he was getting dissatisfied with everything. At 15, he thought, I won't be studying anymore. So he left school, he went away and he became this trainee uh, under a pharmacist, uh, what you uh, that time they used to be called apothecary. So he became a trainee there. And then after a few years, he thought, I'm not happy with what I'm doing. Uh, let me just restart my studies and he wanted to prepare for university entrance. So he prepared, he studied, he studied. He couldn't manage to get entry into any university. But what happened was that because of his rigorous study, especially of Roman plays and all, he ended up writing a play. It was in a verse form. It's called Catalina. It was written exactly in 1850. It was a first drama and it's not that it got any instant success or anything, but he somehow understood that this is his calling. He's going to be a director. And when I was talking about that revolution of 1848 uh, and uh, that went on to 1849, I was talking about nationalism. So in Norway, there was this you know trend that we will be setting up a nationalist theater. What is a nationalist theater? Uh, it is something where the plays are written that focus on the uh, the idea of Norway as a as a nation uh, of the Scandinavian folklores, something which would tie or unite the people of Norway. Now Ibsen, he was asked to write one play every year, uh, and he kind of got into the groove, uh, but the problem lied elsewhere. Ibsen, as a writer, he wanted to present the individual. That is, how an individual acts under certain circumstances. But the theatre of nationalism or the nationalist theatre, that demands the kinds of plays where you look at people as groups. Okay, uh, the working class or the middle class, uh, so, you look at people as groups. Ibsen wanted to look at people as individuals. He was kind of a believer in individualism. Now, during this time, he also got married in 1858 to this woman called Susanna. Now, what was special about this marriage? Unlike people around him, unlike others or other couples that he was seeing around him, Ibsen wanted to have a kind of a marriage which was founded on the idea of equality. Because he was a worshipper of individualism, he thought that marriage should not stop or restrict uh, either the husband or the wife from being the best individual that person can be. The best version of yourself, you know, you have that idea now. But people around him thought he was being unchristian. This was... Like blasphemous, the Bible says otherwise. And he was uh, undermining uh, marriage as an institution because marriage is about the bond between people. And the word bond, it has this connotation of tying up. And Ibsen was talking about freedom. His ideas about different things, different social issues did not match with people. And he was also finding it difficult to produce plays uh, to satisfy the uh, theater of uh, nationalism or the nationalist theater. Although he wrote this play in 1863, The Pretenders, 
uh, which was pretty popular. Um, but it was too late. The theater in Christiania where he was uh, working that uh, went bankrupt. And Ibsen was feeling like I've lost everything. And he was totally dissatisfied with uh, Norway, people of Norway, their expectations. And he wanted to go away. But you had to survive. So he applied for a uh, for a grant. He was awarded with that grant, thankfully. So he went to Italy and a sea change occurred there. He started to uh, experiment more freely this time. He lived in Italy for 27 years. And it was during this period, which is known as the second period of his career, we have the play A Doll's House. This second phase may be seen as the ones in which he wrote about social problems and, and that's why most plays of this time is called problem play. The third period in his career came uh, much later where he explored idealism too. Uh, but that is a different thing uh, and we have to focus now on Doll's House. 1879, that was the year in which he produced this play. What was the audience like? what was happening in their minds during the time. I'm going to draw your attention to three particular years in this context. With respect to Norway, 1884, women were granted the right to pursue higher education like men. 1898, a law was passed allowing women, married women, to have control or authority over property. 1913, women got the right to vote. And Norway was one of the first countries to grant women voting rights. Looking at these three years, you can very well understand what was society like in 1879. Nothing was granted yet. And the stage or theatre had not yet witnessed what realism is. What was the dominant uh, mode of theatre back then? It was the well-made play. Well-made play means a very artificial scenario with exaggerated sentiments and a lot of plot twists, something very artificial. So when the audience first goes and looks at the stage, which is laid bare in front of them, and they look at a very aesthetically decorated living room, they feel that, okay, we are looking at another well-made play. And then they see that a woman comes in and they feel that such a meticulously dressed, prim and proper and cheerful angel in the house is a character from a well-made play. This was Ibsen's strategy. He knew that if he introduced realism without any moment of transition, then the audience might not accept it or understand it, let alone appreciate it. What he very intelligently does is he educates the audience through this play. A Doll's House is not about a play written during the movement of realism. It is a play through which realism is born because the beginning of the play is so very different from how it progresses and how it ends. So let's quickly look at the basic plot line to understand a little bit about the story so that eventually when we'll study it in detail, we'll be able to understand these nuances. So what is the story about? In the first act, we are introduced to the main characters. We have Nora Helmer and her husband Torvald Helmer. Nora has a friend called Christine and we have a character called Dr. Rank who is Torvald's friend but is also very intimate with Nora. Other than these characters, we have Croxted who appears to be the villain of the story, at least in the beginning. And then there are minor appearances of the maid, the nurse, and so on, and the little children too. Nora, from the beginning, is presented as a very cheerful, bubbly, childish woman 
uh, who has three kids and the kids are mostly taken care of by the nurse who was also Nora's nurse when she was a young child. Nora's parents are dead. Her husband is presented as this authoritarian figure, a very dominating person uh, who appears to provide Nora with the necessities of life. And Nora uh, kind of tries to play Torvald to get some money out of him. Uh, and the way this play begins, everything appears to be like a normal home. Again, the word normal is uh, quite a problematic word nowadays. But back then, people thought that this is a normal household. The husband is the provider. The wife is the spendthrift who spends everything away. By the time the play reaches the middle of the first act, uh, we get to see Christine, who is Nora's friend. And she's a widow now. She comes uh, from far. And Nora begins to speak with uh, Christine, saying how she's very excited because her husband has got a job in the bank as a manager and now all their financial troubles were gone. Christine emphasizes the fact that uh, she had been the sole breadwinner after her husband's death uh, and she had to support her mother and her brothers. And that kind of triggers in Nora a feeling that uh, Christine is probably showing an air of superiority because Christine represents a kind of an independent woman. So she also tells Christine that she has also done very serious things in life and she has also saved her uh, husband's life. Uh, by procuring some money with which they could have a trip where he recovered from his illness because her husband was seriously ill. But she does not tell Christine exactly how she got that money. And the audience is also left in suspense. Now, while these things happen, we get to see this character Croxton. He comes and suddenly Nora's appearance changes. It's as if she's having some kind of uh, anxiety inside her. This Croxted fellow, he used to work in the same bank where Torvald is now going to be the manager. And it is seen that Torvald has decided to dismiss him. On what grounds? That he had done some corruption or oh, some act of forgery. Croxted, he comes to Nora and then we realize that it is Croxted from whom Nora had taken the money. And she was paying him back in installments. Croxted blackmails Nora that if he loses his job, he would reveal everything to her husband. As the audience begins to feel very curious as to what is the entire problem here, we get the explanation that while borrowing the money, Nora had not informed anything to her husband. Why? Because her husband never wanted to borrow anything from anyone. That was his moral stand. Secondly, Nora's father was in deathbed. So, she couldn't ask him for money. That would be very bad. And during those days, that's why I gave you those dates earlier. During those days, women were not allowed to keep any bank account, to borrow anything without the husband's consent or parents' consent. So, Nora was in a bit of a problem here. So when she approached Croxted for money, Croxted gave her the money on the condition that she had to sign a bond. And that signature was to be uh, authenticated by her father as a guarantor that in case she cannot pay back, the father will pay back. So Nora said, fine, I'll get my father to sign this. She took that bond and then she returned it signed. But she never gave her father this paper for signature. She signed it herself. And mistakenly, she put the date three days after her father's death. So obviously, this was a very stupid thing to do. But we can understand that Nora, who was not very uh, certain about these official matters, legal matters, she overlooked the whole seriousness of this. And she thought that if I paid back the money, nothing matters. And after all, I'm doing this to save my husband. So she gave the bond to Croxted. And Croxted understood that this was all forged. So now that he had a leverage on Nora, 
he wanted to utilize the situation to its fullest and he ends up asking nora for this favor that he should not be thrown out of the bank we see nora requesting torvald and torvald is completely horrified at the idea that his childish wife could be talking about such serious matters uh interfering in his official business and he gets very offended it was christmas time he wanted his wife to decorate the house to prepare for a fancy ball and not talk about serious things at all interestingly he had already given the job which he had uh, taken away from crockster to christine upon nora's request nora back then didn't know that crockster would turn up so she had asked her husband that uh, my friend she knows about bookkeeping and Torvald said fine i'll then engage her in my office so in a way crockster's fate is sealed in the next two acts what happens is that situations get complicated in the second act we see that nora is getting more and more anxious about the whole thing there is an interaction between nora and dr rank who already appears in the first act but in the second act we see a lot more interaction and there is a kind of a friendship between nora and dr rank which we get to understand as their conversation progresses the dr rank has a certain admiration for nora and he ends up confessing his love for him this dr rank he suffers from uh, a very horrible disease of the spine and he's going to die very soon and his confession is not to gain something out of this relationship of course because he knows he's going to die but it's just like the confession of a dying man nora is visibly upset by the confession because uh, she already knew that she had a sense that dr rank was uh, in love with her but she felt that when he actually told it out loud it broke that romantic element about it and now it was uh, like she was cheating on her husband so anyway uh, dr rank said that he would not be able to continue his visits because he knows that he he's going to stop visiting them very soon is going to die and before he dies he's going to send an envelope with a black cross on it and he doesn't want torvald to visit him in his sick bed because he knows that torvald doesn't like anything messy disorganized and ugly it is in the second act that we really understand what dr rank means by this because whenever torvald comes and there is some housework going on like knitting or arranging uh, nora immediately stops that work or asks that person to leave the place because torvald doesn't like uh, the the chaos of domestic chores he likes a prim and perfect presentation in front of him he doesn't care for the hard work that goes behind it so we see a man who is not participating in his household chores he he considers the children as noisy things and he doesn't want to be around them he feels disturbed while nora is seen to interact with children in a very playful manner back then this was a normal household it was 1879 anyway coming back to the story in the third act a costume party takes place during which when nora and uh, her husband they are upstairs in the party we see crockstead and christine having a conversation earlier christine had told nora that she uh, was in a relationship with crockstead and she when when she came to know about the whole thing from nora that it is crockstead from whom uh, this uh, blackmail is coming and crockstead is about to reveal everything to the husband and crockstead had left a letter in the letter box telling everything to torvald then christine had offered her help to nora saying that i think i have some influence on, on this person i will go i'll try to request him to come and get his letter back and then through their conversation what emerges is that uh, they plan to have a future together and then crockstead feels that okay uh, when my life is going to be settled and I, my children like he is a widower with kids 
and Christine doesn't have any kids. Christine feels like she can be a mother to his children. Uh, so it's a prospect of a very happy ending for them. And Croxted feels that, okay, if I'm having a happy ending, why should I make a woman suffer? Let me take the letter back. Then Christine says that, no, I have seen this house built on lies and deceit. Let Torvald know everything. Let them sort out their differences. Somehow uh, we might at that moment feel that Christine is being um, jealous of Nora. She wants to harm her. But then she is talking sense here. Because a relationship built on deceit and fraud is not going to survive anyway. So Croxter doesn't get his letter back when Nora and Torfell, they come down from their costume party. And they're finally on their own. Nora greets her husband goodnight. And they are in a kind of melancholic mood also because they had already received an envelope from Dr. Rank with a black cross on it, a couple of uh, cards from Dr. Rank. And Nora tells to Torval that this is a sign that he is going to die. And this is like a final letter or final note he is sending to us. Nora also notices that Todwald is sitting down with letters, other letters, which includes Croxter's letter. And she kind of retires to her room and then Torvald calls her back and he demands an explanation. And when he is demanding an explanation that what is this? What have you done? Nora's first reaction is that the Torvald is so protective of me. He is definitely going to protect me. And he is probably going to tell everybody that it is he who has done this to save me and I should not let him sacrifice his honour. This is going on in her mind. But she sees that Torvald is not speaking along those lines at all. He is accusing her and not just that. He is saying that she is going to be a very bad influence on the children. She must stay away from them. We see Torvald really being extremely violent with his words here. He is not ready to understand that what Nora did was for him. But then something happens. Right in the middle of this, the doorbell rings, the maid comes with a letter from Croxter to Nora. Torvald snatches that letter and he finds out that Croxter has decided to stop blackmailing Nora and he has also returned that promising letter that bond. Torvald tears that up and he feels that there is no danger to his honour anymore or his reputation. His mood changes immediately. He tries to tell Nora that, okay, let's forget it all. But what he has not realized is Nora's change of attitude. She suddenly has become calm, thoughtful and frozen, as if she is going through what Aristotle would have called an agnosis. In the final section of the last act, we see Nora wanting to have a serious conversation with Torvald and saying that we have never had a serious conversation all our lives. And what is this serious conversation about? She wants to leave the house. Torvald says, how would you survive? You know nothing about the world. And she says, that is exactly why I should leave. This whole place had been only a place like a doll's house, a child's play, where her worth her dignity had never been given value. So for the first time in the history of theatre, a woman walks out of the stage, slamming the door, the sound of which shook the hearts of the audience looking on. There were uproars. How can a mother leave the children? How can this be a good thing? Doesn't she have any responsibility? How would she survive? The only way she can is by becoming a fallen woman. When this play was arranged to be staged in other countries, especially Germany, because that was a very happening place then, renowned actors, female actors, they refused to play the part of Nora. And Ibsen was seeing that, okay, people are going to change the ending anyway, and if I let any Tom, Dick, Harry change it, then it won't be aesthetic at all. It will be horrible. So let me do that horrible thing myself. 
So he wrote an alternative ending where Nora reconciles to her household. She is reconciling to her husband and she doesn't leave the stage. The point is that alternative ending play didn't work well. It was not popular and people had to get back to the original ending. At the very beginning of this video, I was talking about the difference between play and theatre. We will understand this difference when we will read through the text of the play. But think about that last moment when Nora gets out of the stage with that slam of the door. That sound has rarely been used in theatre till then. The effect that sound has, the effect that silence has. You would notice when we will read the play that Ibsen gives elaborate stage directions. And you might wonder, what's the whole point? Shakespeare only writes exit, enter and that's all. Why is this man giving such long, essay-like stage directions? That is because each and every aspect of the stage is significant. And when you go to see a performance, it's different from when you read a play because in a play you can simply pause reading, go back to your own life, come back to it, read it again. But when you're watching a play, you're watching it for a condensed moment. So every sound, every minor detail of the stage affects you much more than it does when you are a reader of a play. A play is a permanent thing. It's not going to change. But theater is a temporary thing. And therefore, Ibsen's Thrill's house is presented differently across different productions down the ages. But there is something some core element of realism in it, because of which it is still relevant. When I'm recording this, it is 8th March. It's supposed to be a day dedicated to women, more specifically working women, something that Nora really idealizes. This video would be processed and posted sometime around probably 12th, 13th March. On 20th March is the birthday of Henrik Ibsen. So when you talk about relevance of adults' house, don't look at the accomplishments that women have achieved down the line. It is not just about accomplishment of a woman. I believe equality in marriage is an accomplishment of both man and woman. Both have to work hard toward it. And this is what Ibsen said when he was talking at a women's rights convention. He said, I don't know what women's rights are. I don't know what they mean. Because he was talking about human rights. Seeing woman as a human is the most important perspective that he establishes in the play. And I'm sure when we will be reading the play together, you will realize the full implication of it. I hope you liked today's summary and this whole discussion on context and conditions. I'm really looking forward to our detailed study of a doll's house. And also you can check some of the articles which are already posted on our website, uh, especially on the portrayal of Nora and realism in the play. Thank you all for being with us. Stay subscribed and see you all very soon in my next video. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off. Bye-bye.